computer. Can't record on the cloud because my kids ate up my entire cloud and I don't want to spend $100 a month. So here we go. Oh, would be nice if I had gloves. Good evening, everyone. It is now 6 p.m. Um, I forgot what date it was. What, what's the date thing? What did I write on this board? The 8th. It is the 8th, week 9. And this is the neurology lab. And I'm your host, Dr. Grise. And today, let's look at, we always start with the external structures first. All and we look at this. When you look at this right here, you see this covering, right? Try to rip that. See, oh, that's the rip test, right? That it's bad. not easy, is it? Mm -mm. You can't. Okay, and this is a little sheep brain. So you can only imagine. Now, there are layers of this covering of our brain. So there's several things protecting our brain. Number one, when your brain sits in a calvary, that's this bad boy right here. Okay, let me put it up there. See, I need a, I need a camera crew or something. <laughs> See, next university I go to, make sure I got a camera crew. Hint, hint. Mason has one. <laughs> no, yeah, but they also have. Uh, if you're in a class, there's uh, my last class had 62 people in it, so it's better when it's just us. So you see here how it sits perfectly. It's like made for it. Now there's fluid in here and it floats the brain. So that's one form of protection. The other form of protection, look at this. It's thick, it's bone. And of course you have your meninges, which is this thing that we tried to rip and we couldn't, just like your pericardium. Do you guys see a theme here on whoever built us? There's a theme of protection. All the hard stuff on the outside is protecting this soft gooey thing. Now, also feel this. How does that feel compared to the heart and compared to the liver? It's a different level it's, of mushiness, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Right, it's way softer, right? It's like butter. Like, I, like um, we, didn't, we didn't cut it up, but we're gonna, we're gonna cut it up a little bit more. But when we're messing with it, it's very easy to cut and it is laden with fat. And you will also see, this is really the color of fat. You can pick up that end, right? You see the white stuff? It's like, and that's gray matter. I mean, the, the, the gray stuff is gray matter and you have white matter. Now the white matter, of course, has way more fat content, right? So let's go back, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of the gun. Let's go back to this meninges. So you have the cerebrospinal fluid it's covering your entire brain. It's floating your brain, so it protects it that way. The cerebrospinal fluid also does a job. Remember we talked about those, those osmoreceptors and those chemoreceptors when we talked about your lungs? How you really breathe is your body senses the chemical, the chemoreceptor, carbon dioxide. We're not really monitoring the oxygen. And, when you, and it makes sense because if I, if I survey the oxygen in this room and in your room right now, it'll be barely 21%. But carbon dioxide, that's the thing that we're, uh, that we're monitoring. And that's the cerebrospinal fluid. Now, you can look up in your textbook as well, and uh, my lecture as well, this covering. Remember, they had uh, names for the layers of the covering. So you had the uh, dura matter or mater. Now dura, of course, means durable, tough, and that's this outer outer thing that we can't, we can't even shred with our hands. Think about it, dura mater, and mater means in Latin, mother. And what is your mom supposed to do? Protect. Well, in theory, not my mom. <laughs> my mom just beats the crap out of it, right? <laughs> mother you. is supposed to protect you, okay? Someone please tell that to my mom, right? Supposed to protect, but you know, all joking aside, my mom is one of those uh, tough love. You know, I like, uh, you know, the classic Asian mom, like, B, what you got, B? Right, that kind of thing. And uh, why are you in sports? Sports are for stupid people. I remember she said it, she said it to me in front of my coach in the middle of a game in high school. And she was like, this is stupidity. And she walked, she walked away. 
and I was going to uh, state championships and she didn't care. But joking aside and uh, all, all my entertainment aside, mater, protection. So you have the dura mater. And then on the inside is gotta be um, the softer, gentler mother because this is soft and gentle and I have to protect it. So in the inside layer, and this is, it's not shown here because it probably wore away. That is your pia mater. And in between is your arachnoid. And that has all the blood vessels. So even the covering of your brain has a lot of blood vessels and it's feeding your brain. And there's also a whole bunch of blood vessels that are also feeding your brain. Now, what happens in a stroke? Just like we talked about the heart attack. If the blood vessel that's supposed to feed this part of my brain isn't bringing me oxygen, what happens to that part of the brain? What happened? Someone, anyone, tell me. It dies. It dies. So all of you drinkers out there, myself included, every time you got a hangover, that pain you're feeling, that is localized hypoxemia in your brain. That means you killed brain cells. Now, when I was a frat boy, I used to try to tell myself that, oh, it's killing all the weak ones. No, stupid. It's killing the ones you need. You are born with a finite set of brain cells. And you are supposed to try to protect them. There's so many things to protect them. But if you keep on doing drugs, keep on doing alcohol, and, uh, and also not working out your brain. That's why I always say study daily, find time to study daily because it's just like working out, right? You, it, your, your brain craves working out. You know what I do when I'm at the bus stop or when I'm bored, maybe I'm on, I'm on a line at the mall because you know it's holiday season. I play puzzle games, brain games. Me, I love video games, but, but typical video games are, well, except for the, these new ones, they're so complicated, but. Typical video games from the 80s and 90s are for brainless, brainless people. Like you play Pac-Man, I love Centipede. There's no, not a lot of thinking going on in that game. But my puzzle games, I love um, this, um, and you could, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not getting paid for this, but this is a game called Panic Room, and it's uh, for Android. You gotta figure out puzzles and it uses your mind. And those of us who um, uh, are in geriatrics and in elder care know that if you do not excite this and use this, what happens? What we, we said before, if you don't use it, you lose it. And that also happens. So you have a break coming up. My advice is, yes, you know, have your little vacation, but every day still train. All right. I guess you guys heard all the stories about my son. Hopefully my son's coming, coming home for a couple of days next week. You know, he wakes up at five o'clock in the morning to take a 10 mile run with Ruck and with his boots on. Why? So he can still stay hard for when he has to go back out in the world. Same thing with my daughter. My daughter, she ran a juice company, but you know what she did for the last six months? Study for an MCAT. Because she knows if I don't exercise my brain, even though I'm, you know, she's an entrepreneur. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not knocking business, but the brain, the thinking required for healthcare is complex. And it, it, and I dare anybody who's in elder care, look at all the people who are in the medical field and all the people who were teachers. Look at how their personality is when they're in their 80s. They're sharp as a tack, aren't they? My mother is what, 81, 82 years old? I don't see any real personality changes since, since you know, I can remember. My mom has always been my mom. But my father, he was in business. He was also an accountant, rest his soul. He retired at the ripe old age of 56. And he retired a millionaire. So what do you think he did after 56? Nothing. Watch WWE, uh, Jerry Springer. He, oh, he loves Jerry Springer. Well, watch it all day. What do you think happened to his brain? What do you think happened to these grooves? These little grooves here. They right? They stopped getting deeper. These little bumps here also stopped growing. Now, they did this experiment in the 50s. They had an agreement with all like the geniuses of the world. 
And they said, like people like Einstein, they said, when you die, can we autopsy your brain? And a lot of them, like Enrico Fermi and um, uh, what do you call that? Einstein and all of them said, yes. He goes, yeah, cool. Because they're scientists. They also want to know how this thing works. They found that these grooves here, which are called a sulcus, sulci for a uh, plural, and these bumps here, gyrus, they are significantly larger and deeper in people who utilize their brain on a regular basis. Now, did we not also look at people who do drugs and people who have a mental disease or defect? Yep, guess what? The people who have mental disease or defect had better grooves, better bumps or sulci and gyri than people on heroin. So what does drugs do to this? It poisons it. And what does it do? It minimalizes thought because when you're high, what you're not thinking, right? You just, you know, it's just a bombardment of chemicals. So it got flat. And when it gets flat, you do stupid things, you know, like, uh, like uh, rob a 7 Eleven with cops in it. I had a friend who did that. It's hilarious. Thank goodness it was in a time in the 80s where, you know, cops asked first, asked questions first. Remember that time when cops asked first? <laughs> now it's crazy. It's dangerous. So the bumps, gyrus. The grooves, sulcus. And that's important because you could also see that the, the bumps and the little grooves, welcome, welcome, form uh, lines and fissures that will now demarcate what's front, what's back, what's middle, what's up, what's down. So that's our next part. Okay, and uh, here I got a brain for you. So I can move here so I can be close to the action. Okay. Move this. Oh, this, these, these circle chairs, I get, uh, I get flashbacks of how patient, because you're like this and you just roll next. <laughs> Next, bring me another one next. And uh, outpatient starts at, I don't know, 7 a.m., ends at 8 ish. Hate outpatient department, especially if you're in a, um, um, what do you call it? Urban. If you're in an urban, like in a city, uh, and especially if it's uh, low to no cost, uh, like when I was in the Bronx, it was only $5 to get seen. So you can you can imagine everybody and their sister came in. Uh, insurance, no insurance. So let's look at the the parts. Okay. So just like the lecture, there's a front part. Here's your half. Well, well let's get multiple halves so that you know everyone. So if you have yours, yours. Merry Christmas. I never, oh, oops. I never say I never got you anything. <laughs> don't take it home. We're gonna have a environmental protection agency on our butt. Yeah, a couple terms ago, Dr. Grass is okay if I brought one. I just brought one of them home, and and then I was like, no, you can't. You know, because it might have disease or whatnot. And she said, goes, oh, I brought it last time. I go say what? And I, and so ever since then, when you guys leave, I make sure I count all the parts. <laughs> But no, you guys aren't like that. Oh, see? Oh, look at the difference. See this one? This is a dumb sheep. Not too bright. Because look how flat. Right? Yeah. Look at yours. Yours has a lot of bumps and a lot of grooves, the little gray grooves. So that was a smart sheep. This one, I guess, is medium smart. But this one's dumb as paste. This one probably, you know, ate paste. Because you could see or had lesser development. But let's look. So the front part, and that's the, that's the meninges, the covering of the whole brain. So you've heard meninge, meningitis, right? If you have meningitis, oh, by the way, you guys have meningitis, whether it's viral or bacterial or whatnot, get the fudge out of the room. Don't hang out in there. It's highly contagious, okay? So if you're assigned to that patient, go in there, hi, bye, leave. Uh, um, suit up, PPE all day, every day. Um, uh, especially viral meningitis. It's extremely, uh, uh, this is how I treat the patient when I, when I know they got viral meningitis. Uh, I talked to the nurse to talk to another nurse through the door. 
I ain't going in that room uh, because uh, it is extremely uh, virulent. Uh, and remember, if it gets through all the coverings and all the protection and gets at your brain, your brain is sterile. Meaning to say is it's one of the few places in your whole entire body that have absolutely no bacteria. Just imagine if any bacteria or a virus or anything get in here, how much trouble are you in? You're in a lot of trouble. And also we can't really readily do surgery on your head. I'd have to, you know, open up your skull, open up the other uh, meninges. There's a whole bunch of horrific things that I would have to do to get in at this. That's why if you're in neurosurgery, um, survival rates are around 52, 53%. If you're already, if they're, if they're willing to already cut into your brain, you're in a lot of trouble. And um, I told you guys, my mom's a neuropsychiatrist, not a lot of times in her career where she said, yeah, sure. Let's have, let's call, let's call neurosurgery because when we call neurosurgery, you're in a lot of trouble. Uh, so if you have a tumor in there, that's inoperable or, uh, or, or even if it is operable, like uh, we think, we think three times, four times before we, uh, before we do anything. So we see there's a front part, right? And if you look at the diagram, where's the frontal lobe? It's here, the front part. So that's your frontal lobe, okay? Now, your frontal lobe is responsible for judgment and decision-making. That's why uh, if any of you ever went to the emergency room and had a mini mental status exam, they ask you questions like, if I dropped a $100 bill, on the ground, what would you do? What would you do if I dropped a hundred dollar bill on the ground? Give it to you. Okay. What would you do? Maybe if nobody's there. If no one's looking, I take it. it. See, take see it. how these answers are normal. <laughs> I had a patient who had frontal lobe damage because um, uh, she smashed her face. Uh, she was a truck driver. She smashed her face and hit her forehead and broke her left eyeball socket. And when I asked her, if I dropped a hundred dollars on the floor, she goes, is it okay if I eat it? And I'm like, okay, uh, let's call neurology. Uh, mini mental status exam is over. Oh, I asked her, it was what, 1998. Uh, and I asked her, um, he goes, hey, what year is it? Year of the dragon? And I go, are you Chinese? No, I think it's the year of the dragon, like 1990 dragon. And I'm like, oh boy. And I'm like, uh, you know who I am? And he goes, she goes, yeah, who am I? Yeah. So what does that say about her orientation? He's out, he's not there, right? And uh, I just, but we have to go through all of our procedures. I could, I could have told you before the mini mental status exam, you smash your face and your forehead uh, on a hard truck steering wheel. If you guys ever see the steering wheel of a truck, you know, like the, those 18 wheelers, right? It's hard. And the dash is equally hard. And if you got hit with a force enough to rattle you uh, from, you know, sitting all the way back in your chair, all like, that's what a good foot and a half, two feet, the smacking your head. That's a no bueno situation. Now you look at number five here, you got the parietal lobe. And that's up here at the top, right? So there's two of them. You have your left and right, right? So this is how I always say it. I have a pair of parietal, okay? And that's the ones up top. Now, your temporal lobe, if you look this way, it's on the sides. And you can see there's also a sulcus or a groove here. You see how it kind of demarcates it right here? Now, oh, I forgot to mention, what does the parietal lobe do? Well, that part is uh, a lot of it has to do with your um, the coordination between your motor and your sensory, right? So everything you feel, everything you're sensing all around your environment is in the parietal area. Now the temporal, the big thing about temporal is hearing, okay? And in the back, that's your occipital lobe. And the big thing about occipital is vision. Right. And of course, Dr. Grice has a story about that. I played the position of catcher, you know, in baseball. Right. I'm the guy who stands behind the, the batter. Well, one moron, I was in like uh, seventh grade. 
I took, you know, when the ball goes up in the air as a pop fly, I took my helmet off because the, the old helmets, it's hard to, it's hard to see uh, the ball coming down. So I'm about to catch the ball. This idiot batter takes an extra swing. I don't know why, but he wanted to. And the bat hit the back of my head in the occipital region. Uh, I couldn't see for about 15 minutes. I was blind. You can only imagine what, what it, if that happened to a seventh grader, how much they freaked out. I freaked out. I was like, oh my God. I, I was crying so hard I threw up. And my coach didn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, oh, I saw gray and then, oh, oh. But, oh, that's, I have a long list of head trauma, right? So uh, it's, uh, it's amazing what you can get used to and survive. Well, back there, that's your occipital lobe. So if you had a stroke in any one of these parts, what would happen to the functions of each of these parts? There's going to have a problem, right? Frontal lobe, I'm going to have a judgment problem. Uh, parietal lobe, I'm going to have either a motor, depending what the area is, or a sensory problem. If it's uh, temporal, odds are I'm going to have a hearing problem. And if it's occipital, odds are I'm going to have a vision problem. Doesn't that look like a nice question for your final next week? I could point to something and I say, it goes, what part is it? That's one way to answer it. Then I could ask you, what, what does this area do for us? And that's actually how the Department of Neurology when they play those, you know, they, they make you do those little exercises or, you know, when the cop pulls you over, you guys are looking at me like, no, I've never been pulled over. Am I the only one who gets pulled over here? Right. All right. I'm living the uh, stereotype. Okay. So they make, you know, the cop, when they pull you over, they make you do tests, right? Like touch your nose and all that. Isn't that coordination? Right. Okay. Eye and ear. So is not a coordination between your, your parietal and your occipital and they're right next to each other. Does that make sense? I also have to mention as an honorable mention for the temporal lobe right here for not only hearing, but also for balance. But uh, another thing that they have here in the uh, temporal lobe closer to the occipital lobe is a place called Broca's area. That's B-R-O-C-A named after, I don't know, this guy named Broca. Now, do you guys notice that in order for you to understand what I said, you would have to hear it, understand the words, process it, and then be able to say it back to me. Now, what happens if you have aphasia and if you have a temporal lobe damage? Don't you think you're going to have a problem telling me stuff? Right? right. And one of those things is that um, one kind of aphasia is like, uh, let's say for this, there's a probe, right? I put it in my patient's hands and then I, or, or let's say it was a pen, right? And I say to my patient, Hey, what is it? And they're like, uh, it's a, ooh, yeah, it's a thing. What do you do with it? Yeah, uh, uh, you write with it. Oh. And then they get really frustrated, right? Or they go, oh, doc, this is an elephant. Next question. And you're like, huh? No, no, this, this thing right here. Yes, this is an elephant. Yes. You sure? Yes, this is called an elephant. What do you do with this? you write with it, it's an elephant. So do you see there's a disconnect and that's your temporal lobe, that's Broca's area. So if you have a patient that has a hard time communicating with you and it's, it's not a language problem, that's, and that's how neurology, it's called localizing. It's how when they ask you questions and they make you do these little exercises, it's how they figure out what part of the brain is messed up, okay? And, uh, and also uh, like, like, for example, the front part, Let's say your judgment's all out of whack. Um, I had a patient who had a frontal lobe tumor. Um, he was walking around. Um, uh, he was only naked from his pants down. And he was punching people in a mall. In like, um, like a, 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 it was a chicken joint uh, when the cops brought him in. And apparently he was pantsless. Again, judgment. Oh, by the way, no history of any drug abuse, no history of alcohol, and um, no history of any crime whatsoever. And they picked him up random one day, 32-year-old male uh, in, in the Bronx uh, at a chicken joint with no pants and punching people in the face. And he wasn't even angry. He was like, I just had this urge, Dr. Arias. And I'm like, 
please don't punch me. He goes, can I punch you? And I'm like, no, no, I don't think so. Right. <laughs> of course, what do I do? I stay back. We called neurology. And what, what did we find? What did we find on MRI? He had a frontal lobe tumor and it was messing with his judgment and messing with his impulse control. Right. And it was funny because you're asking him, well, were you going to do something sexual? Why did you pull on your pants? He goes, were you hot? Because uh, I had another patient. Um, when you do a lot of like um, amphetamines and stuff like cocaine, when they start coming down, they get these things called formication. Not fornication, but formication, formites, which is like ants. That's why they're always scratching themselves. Because what happens when pain starts transitioning to no pain? It starts, it, where it feels like itching. So they feel like they have ants all over their body. So they're all, so this guy, and it, was, it wasn't that cold. It was like September, October, but he was scratching so much that um, he took off his pants and his shoes and he was uh, scratching himself with a Brillo pad that he found in the garbage. This is also the neat part of, of being in healthcare. I only was practicing for six years. I got stories for days. Every day is an adventure. Every day was like, Something are you now. freaking kidding me? This, I can't make this stuff up. And then I tell my mom these stories when I, when I come home, my mom goes, yeah. He goes, you ever have somebody uh, 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 take off their skin with a knife? I've had that. And I go, why? Oh, he had formication. He thought there was ants crawling up and down his leg. So he started cutting up his leg. He started cutting the skin off his leg because he was so itchy. And I'm like, nope, hadn't had one of those yet. And he goes, oh, that's common. He goes, oh, he goes, oh, why don't you see that? And I'm like, and then I was like, wow, okay. But every time you guys don't want to study or don't want to try to, he goes, I'll try to motivate yourself and know that, uh, come on, the, the water's fine. The freak show is awesome. I kind of actually miss it. I'm actually tempted. Someone was uh, telling me, reminding me that there's reciprocity in Washington, D.C., and I should practice again. And I said, uh, I don't know. Retaking my boards? Ugh. I don't know. I'm not quite, too quite sure I want to do that. Now, we already went through the parts. Do you see this extra cauliflower thing in the back? Right? That's your cerebellum. That has a lot to do with blood pressure, right? And uh, some, uh, some other items. And when you look on the back of it, do you see when you look on the inside? Looks like kind of like a tree. Yeah. The tree of life. And that's why they call it in Latin, arbor vitae, or tree of life or living tree. Because it looks like a tree, right? But that is your cerebellum. Okay, and of course, your spinal cord. Now, you will notice there's gray matter and white matter. Do you guys notice on your spinal cord, right? Do you notice on the brain here, on your cerebellum part or the top part, that's gray on the outside, white on the inside? Do you notice on the spinal cord, it's switched? The gray is now on the inside and the white stuff is on the outside? Check that out for a second. And the reason why that is so is called the decussation of fibers. Now, decussation is just a fancy word of crossing, right? So that explains why when you get a stroke that damages your motor and sensory on your left side of your brain, that the manifestations will be on the right side of your body and vice versa. It's because of these crossing of fibers. And it's pretty smart because whoever built us built us freaking smart. So if I have damage to the left side of my brain, it will affect the right. And if I have damage to the right side of my brain, it'll affect the left so that I can somehow still kind of be in balance. Isn't that weird? Whoever built us that way, you know? And I told you guys the, my alien story, right? When I first started teaching, that's why I always say the aliens because I had a young lady stand up in class and I, and I always, you know, I'm politically correct and say, oh, whoever you believe created us, right? So it covers all, all religions and all beliefs. Right, she goes, yes, the pyramid aliens. And I go, excuse me? Because I thought she had a question. She goes, yes, the people who created all of us were the pyramid aliens. 
And I was like, and everyone was giggling and chuckling. But here's the thing. Do you know if that's real or not? Can anyone, that's why they call it belief or faith. You don't know. I'm a Catholic. You ever know the story of Catholicism? Three things in one guy. The spirit, that sounds crazy. Who died and came back. My own, my own 14 year old calls Jesus Christ uh, the greatest zombie that ever lived. Because that's what he was. He came back to life. Right? If you look at every belief, it seems crazy. But what I'm trying to relate to you guys is if your patient believes in something and they're not, no, there's no mental disease or defect, let them believe in it because that's what's going to get them through. Okay. When that, you know, a lot of times I'm a, I'm a consummate pessimist, but a lot of times, and remember, this is electrical and chemical. What controls the chemicals? We already uh, had a lecture on what controls the chemistry of your body, emotion, right? So if you are, if you want to promote a negative attitude and you're thinking the world's going to die and everything's going to, everything's going to go rotten all day, every day, what's going to eventually happen to your chemistry? It's going to gear itself towards what? The negative. And then you'll start noticing bad things, right? I'm not saying to be also overtly positive, but let's say, for example, whatever your patient believes in, guess what? You're going to believe in it too, right? Uh, and I always told the story. Did I tell you guys about the Santa Nino? I have, uh, there's a big Dominican population. Well, any Latin American population, a lot of them are Catholic. But a lot of them pray to these little dolls, including Filipinos. Um, ever since I saw the little doll, they call it a Santo Nino, which is like a little baby Christ. But is baby Christ in a like a king's robe or whatever? It's crazy. But she refused to go into pre-op and she was clutching it in her hand. And then I was trying to tell her in my most broken Spanish, like, you can't bring that into uh, the operating room because it's not sterile. You know what I did? Because she really wanted to hold it on. I go, how's this? And I was gloved up. And I go, how's this? Me and you were going to hold, like in pre-op, we induced um, the anesthesia. So now she's feeling numb, right? So I'm holding her hand. But throughout that time, what am I doing? I'm taking that thing out of her hand, right? And then they induced it, right? When she came out at post-op, what did I do? I put the little doll back in her hand. And I go, oh, see? Look. Santa Nina was with you the whole entire time. Look at that. And then the nurse is like, that's why are you messing with her? I'm not messing with her. I'm making sure she has something to believe so that she can get through post-op because uh, that procedure she had is a lot of pain, a lot. And she was what, 58, 57 and not in the best shape in the world. So whatever you need to do to keep your patient motivated Right. And there's been a lot of studies on this, especially with cardiovascular patients, because when someone has a heart attack, they have something, a feeling of doom. Anyone here know anybody had a heart attack? Ask them, how did you feel when that chest pain came? And as they always say, like I was going to die. I felt like this was it. And that feeling of impending doom, that's how you know that's an um, acute myocardial infarction, even though the pain like. Uh, the, the pain is acceptable and they can handle and tolerate the pain, but they'll all say the same thing. Like, oh man, I thought this was it, right? It hurt, but I was handling the pain, but I thought my heart was going to stop. And, but if you, what do you do, right? Even if you're first responder, even if you're a nurse or whoever you are, even if you're a person cleaning the damn garbage, you have to stay positive and keep, and keep your patient positive and motivated because that messes with the chemical portion in here and also same with sleep okay you guys love cramming i look in the room right next to where they're taking their final i looked in there they're all they're all in the dark number one they all look sad because they know it's gonna be a hard exam right but they all had this look of like they haven't slept in a couple of days now if you do if you do an all-nighter and you don't let this thing rest so that the chemicals and the electricity can regenerate itself, how well can this thing remember what you are trying to remember? It's not gonna do it very well. And also, if you don't treat it right, sleep, you don't feed it right, okay? Uh, it's not a good thing. 
So let's look at some other parts. No, 1920, sulcide gyri, we already went over. Uh, one, two, cerebellum, cerebellum. Oh, I mentioned the big thing. This whole entire big thing right here, that's of course the cerebrum. And that includes all the lobes that we just talked about. But this thing, this cauliflower thing on the back, that's just, uh, cerebellum. Then of course you have the spinal cord and then the gray and the white matter is what? Switched, Switched or crossed. And that's the decussation of fibers. And you guys who have any stroke victims in your family know that what? I got a stroke on the left side, it affects what? The right. right. And a stroke could do what? Sensory and or motor. So um, like my aunt, she couldn't feel anything on the right side of her face, but her face was okay. But my grandfather had motor issues. So what happens to his face? He got droopy, right? Uh, because if it is in the cerebellum here, in your parietal area, which deals with motor and sensory, what happens? Because this is, this is why your face is your face. There is a constant message from your brain to your face, reminding your face that this is what your face is, right? But what happens when that stops? Did you guys also ever notice, anyone here has been married like a million years? Nobody here? No, don't get married, it's not good, right? I've been married for 23 years, it's not good, right? I'm trapped, so you don't need to be trapped. Ha <laughs> ha, did I say that? I'm sorry, Mrs. Garias, if you watch my YouTube. No, she knows I'm kidding, right? But if you ever see people who've been married like a long time, look at your parents. Did you see your parents when they were young? They look like two different people. Do you see your parents when they got old? They start looking like brother and sister, didn't they? Yeah. Because... When you start looking at somebody and, and uh, identifying with that other person, your brain will start doing what? Mimicking it, right? Uh, any of you have any adopted kids in your family, right? Right now, my Imogen, uh, she's adopted. My youngest is two years old. She looks like her, her, her brother, just like her brother. Why? Because who she's surrounded with all day her brother and her older sister. And of course, that's my biological kids. So they look like me. So what does Imogen now look like? Yeah. Looks like me. I'm like, and, and that's why I'm like, and also I'm one of those parents, like I don't care adopted or not adopted. Um, being, a, being a daughter or a son is a lifelong thing and it has nothing to do with your birth. Birth is like that one day, yeah, it was really cool and all, but it's all the days. Uh, what makes a parent and what makes a child is all the days after. Um, and that's what I try to get with a lot of, especially with a lot of patients who are dealing with those issues of, uh, you know, of abandonment, because of course. And uh, my daughter's story is very classic. Um, well, it isn't classic. It's one of my wife's second cousins. She works overseas and her boyfriend got her pregnant. Yeah, right now. She got like five kids of her own. She can't bring the other kids back and their husband and all that. And especially in a Catholic country. So she was going to give them up for adoption. And for whatever reason, my wife goes, you know, five kids isn't enough. Let's make it an even six. Let's have six kids in the house so we can just be totally crazy. But no, it's not. It's an exaggeration because you guys know my two eldest are already adults. But again, behavior you were wondering where I was going to get with this. Behavior is also dictated by these chemicals here. Okay. And so it's also dictated not only by genetics, of course, your, your genes, but what you get exposed to. Because remember, your sensory, you're always picking up stuff, right? And what is your brain always doing? Processing it. And then you have a motor, which is your descending fibers, which will then do what? react on it. So let's look at some other parts. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Did I do frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe? Oh, okay. Let's look at the fissures. So if you look at this whole brain, when you put those together, right? You see how it naturally, there's a line, a really deep line in the middle. And that's your medial longitudinal fissure. And that makes sense because it's medial, it's in the middle and it's long, so it's longitudinal. 
And then it separates your brain into the left and right. And we already know the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, the, the, the wires what? Cross. And when the wires cross, they also talk to each other. So have you ever heard of that BS? Like, oh, if you're left-sided, what is it? What was it? If you're left-sided, you're more creative. You, you, is it creative left side? Left-sided, left, left brain, you're creative. Right brain, you're more mathematical. I think so. That's a little. Something like that. No, we are all creative when we are all mathematical. Because in order to be creative, you know, when someone draws, they have to know spatial relationships, which require what? Knowing what's, what's longer, what's shorter, and also symbolism and all, all those things, right? And the same thing for mathematics. When you get into higher mathematics, it starts becoming an art form. When you guys get into your clinical higher, why do you think why when we, most lay persons get amazed when a clinician can read a patient? Have you, have you ever like maybe just talk to somebody and go, something's up, something's wrong. That is called precognition or precox feeling. Have you ever met somebody, all your viewers at home, and you know there's something wrong? You know, they, they look normal. They're saying normal things, but in your heart of hearts, you ever feel that? Maybe you're on a date and you're like, this guy's a psycho. There's something like wrong. There's a there. I'm, there's a, I got to get out of here. That is the culmination of all your sensory telling you what? Sums up. And that's why when I teach ethics class, one of the things that we try to teach you is if it if it messes with your gut, your gut feeling, like you feel wrong about something, then what? It's wrong, right? Uh, because that, because all your sensory is coming together and your brain is processing it. And then your brain is giving you what? Some chemical signals in the form of a feeling. So that thing about clinicians have to be robots and we can't be feeling, no, we have to. And many times you have to feel your patient out. Like, are they lying to me? And those of us who are parents, right? This is good. I, I always tell my wife, since she got all these lying kids, that uh, she could be an FBI profiler. Because, you know, moms know, know stuff. They look right at, uh, uh, how many times Duke came home and looked right at his mom. And, and he said to me, to my face, nothing happened, Pop. It was a good deployment. And he goes, everyone came home, right? No funerals to go to this time. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then my, my wife took one look at Duke and goes, who's in the hospital? And then Duke's eyes went dark and went, six of us. And I go, hmm, how many of them can walk? Duke. And then he stopped talking. And, and I was like, because, right? Right, your kids are really good at lying. Yeah. So let's look at this stuff. Let's look at this other stuff. Let's look at this a little bit more closely. So we already know the spinal cord, and that's the connection from your brain to the rest of your body. So remember those ascending fibers that we talked about? That's your sensory, right? They usually go uh, uh, up the uh, anterior portion of this. So if this is the brain, this would be the front part. And then your motor would be the posterior. So if this thing gets damaged in certain places, don't you think the signal might go bad? And that's why we're very careful for any spinal nerve damage or any spinal cord damage or any vertebrae damage. What's another thing we're looking at here? Now, if we're looking at here, this is of course the brainstem, mandula, and the brainstem then connects into this little bump. Did everyone see this bump right here? So you have the spinal cord and then there's like, it's a little thicker portion. That's right here. And then you could see, uh, what do you call that? So this is the spinal cord. This little bump here is medulla, but then this bigger bump that's a little closer up to the front, that is your pons. So to reiterate, you have your spinal cord here. Then there's a part where it gets thicker. See that part? That's your medulla. Then there's a part right here. That's your pons. And we already know what the pons does. We already talked about that for, uh, uh, um, uh, for respiratory. 
also here the medulla as well they all we also talked about its role in the gustatory how does it control um uh satiety and do you notice all the stuff like that have to do with breathing and eating and blood pressure do you see how it's deep inside the brain like whoever created this was okay if i lose my judgment okay if i lose some of my motor or my sensory but all the really important stuff like breathing eating right and blood pressure they're all down here so again back to form equals function if it's really important it's deep so if you have an inoperable tumor that's really deep like a pontine tumor right here it's hard to get at because i'd have to cut through all of this to get at that i got to cut through the brain cerebral spinal fluid then the um meninges and then through all of this stuff that's a mess right what's next uh midbrain celsius okay now let's look at the bottom so put your brains together because the the halves together because we're going to need to look at um uh the bottom parts now the bottom parts you're going to see right here in the middle oh this is a good one right here do you see in the middle right here like there's an x that is your optic chiasm okay and your optic chiasm reads leads right up to your optic tract which will then of course be your optic nerve so you see the x here on yours so that's the optic chiasm so anything happens here you know and this controls the coordination between my two eyeballs and it's also the reason why you have what they call edinger westfall response meaning that your eyes move you know if, if both your eyes look left I mean, if you want to look at something left, both your eyes should be looking left. That's what I'm saying. Like, you know, when I look at you, my eyes don't go that way. I know my eyes are messed up, but they don't go like that, right? They go all the, uh, the same. So that's your optic nerves. And then of course, that's optic chiasm leading to an optic tract, right? And tract just means what? Wire, cable, road. And then of course that tract leads up to the optic nerve. And we already know where the optic nerve ends up ends up in the retina in the back part of your eye, okay? So if my patient has a basal skull fracture, don't you think I could mess that up too, right? I could, you know, I, I, I could mess that. And when you become blind, when that nerve gets cut, when that nerve gets damaged, does it get better? As of today, as of uh, this technology, it does not. So when you become blind, it's it. So that's why, Diabetic retinopathy, I'm such a big, big opponent or against it because it's preventable, you know? Uh, so that's my thing. Now, you'll also notice right here. Let's see if it's uh, uh, labeled. Yeah. You see, when you put your grains together, there's these two bulbs. You can see it here look like little pedicles or little feet you see it here like when you look on the under look at the under part you see it mm -hmm. like little things little things sticking out remember when we looked at um the upper respiratory tract and we looked at the uh nasal cavity and there was like these holes inside the uh your cribriform plate which is uh the the plate right on your ethmoid this is where those hair cells are going to stick out into your nose and then it gets you know uh, right into your um, uh, your cranial nerve one, which is your olfactory. Hence, that this is your olfactory bulb. So this has to do with smell. This is, has to do with vision. And then also all this other stuff we, we went over, like you have your spinal cord, medulla, and your pons. Okay? So like I stated, it's a pretty straightforward um uh straightforward it's not really dissection oh wait why, why am i why am i getting excited we gotta look why am i we gotta look at its view from the inside now we already looked at the view from uh from outside but now let's look at the halves and we already looked at let's see what's what's important now 
the first thing you're going to see is when you look at this, does everyone see here? Like there's this big white thing. Mm -hmm. It goes like that. Everyone see that? Yeah, that's it. You see that big white matter? Mm -hmm. That is your corpus callosum. Remember I stated that the left and the right, there's no such thing as only left, only right. The left and the right work together, right? So in order to be an artist, you have to be a little bit mathematical. In order to be mathematical, you gotta be a little bit of an artist. You gotta you know, feel your way around the, a problem. Well, that's your corpus callosum. That connects your left and your right together, okay? You sever that or you damage that, oh, uh, that is a no bueno uh, situation. Now, right on 31, that's right, right under what's uh, 31, what's the, the, now, remember we had this little bump, the ponds. Now, when you follow it up, there's a big bump. If you go underneath the corpus callosum, do you see how there's like, I don't know, there's like this webbing inside and then there's these holes underneath. You see that, that there's a hole? Like this is your corpus callosum and you got a hole here and your hole here and then also another hole here and another hole here. Well, all those holes are ventricles. Just like the ventricles of our heart, they're chambers, they're rooms. And if you see this, if you look at this, well, this one's missing it. You see this as the webbing? It looks like a little, like, I don't know, like cobwebs. You see it on yours? Yeah, you see some of it, right? How about yours? Oh, see, look at this. This is a very big ventricle. But you, you can see here, it's like cobwebs. Here, here, let me tease some of it out. But do you see there's a room here? There's a room here, and there's one here, and one here. Do you see that? Well, those are ventricles. You have four of them in your brain. Now, the ventricles, they house and create cerebral spinal fluid. Cerebral spinal fluid is very, very important. It is the main communication and main sensory communication fluid in your brain, and it connects into your spinal cord. That's why when I do a spinal tap, I can, I can tap and biopsy the direct fluid that's in direct contact with your brain. So it's a way that I can see what's going on metabolically, chemically with your brain without doing what? You know, carving a hole in your head, right? We usually do it in between uh, L3 and L4, which is lumbar three, lumbar four. When we take a needle, you can look it up on YouTube. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is what's inside here. And I use the word cobwebs and web-like material because it's the same material that's in your uh, arachnoid covering of your, dura matter. well, there's dura matter, then there's the arachnoid, and then there's a pia matter. There's, uh, there's at least three levels, right? And there's cerebrospinal fluid in there too, all around inside this and inside circulating. And all of this is circulating. All of this is to help communication because remember, communication in your brain is not only electrical, it's chemical. chemical. So if I zap you with a taser, it's going to mess things up. If I give you crack cocaine, it's going to mess you up. So anything that will bring imbalance to either the electrical or the chemical balance. Now, I'm using extreme examples, but what if I make you hypernatremic? What if you didn't pay attention to your line and now they got a ton of sodium in there. That's a problem, isn't it? What if you're not paying attention to the line and there's a ton of potassium in there? Isn't that going to mess, uh, mess with the chemistry of all of that? Yes. So even there's no such thing as a little task, even though they say stuff like, um, especially in your first year as a nurse, you do a lot of uh, what they call SCUT activities. SCUT is an acronym in medicine called, they call you a SCUT monkey. I know that's a horrible thing to say. But uh, that's old school uh, because SCUT stands for some common unimportant task. I am here to tell you there is no such thing in medical. Every little thing can kill you if you let it. So watch that uh, IV, watch the fluid intake, watch the fluid outtake because what meds are they taking? 
What kind of mentation? That is big. Just, just going to your patient every once in a while. Hey, Susan. Hey, what's going on? Yeah. And he goes, oh, what are you doing today? And then you use your clinical eye. Wait a minute. So why is Susan being friendly to me? She usually yells curses at me. Why is she friendly to me today? Or the exact opposite. She's usually friendly to me. And then she's crabby today. She might be in a pain state. Something might be irritating her. Hey, Sue, what's going on? Miss Susan? Well, don't call her Sue. We'll go. I always like using titles like Ms. or Mr. Right? Miss Susan. What's going on? Yes, uh, you've been on the crabby side today. Whoa, my side hurts. Did you tell the doctor that? He goes, well, I tried to. She said it was okay. And, and then I do what? I look at it. Then I look at my partner going, she's complaining of pain. And she goes, hey, I wasn't bothering her that bad. And he goes, well, it's bothering her now. Now, you see, if I didn't ask, what would you have done? Leave it alone. And you could see how vital our job is and how it's a little bit of an art. It's a little bit of a... And also just, just overall give a damn, you know? And that's the best thing to do. Now, oh, do, 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 do. what else do they want to look at? We already white matter, gray matter. Let's look at, oh, what is underneath is your thalamus. So let's look at this for the people in lab. We already have these ventricles, right? We already know that. But do you see this bump in here? The bump right underneath your third ventricle, that's your thalamus. Okay, and of course, underneath it is your hypothalamus. And uh, we already talked about how um, before that um, it, you see how it's in this relationship here? It's the thalamus is like a relay station for sensory. Now, just imagine, if any of you watch that Superman movie, remember when like the bad guys, like they couldn't hear anything or couldn't see anything because they have super senses, they got super eyes and super ears, right? Just imagine if your brain didn't filter out everything. You'd hear everything, wouldn't you? You'd see everything, it would be too much. So your thalamus kind of acts like a relay station, only telling you what's important, like for example, How's your chair feel? You'll feel your chair now because what? I mentioned it. But a minute ago, this is a very uncomfortable chair. Your butt will go numb because why? It's, it's not important to me right now. What's important to me is like me looking at this, trying to remember what things are looking like, but then you're not feeling, you know, your feet or your butt, right? Or your back, right? So let's underneath that, let's see, let's put another one. We already went through that part. We already went through that part. What's another thing that we miss? Ah, inferior and superior is colliculus. You don't need to know. Yeah, we went through everything. We went through everything. Let me look at all the lists. We went through all the lobes, we went through gray matter. This hemisphere is right and left. Ooh, hypothalamus. We didn't go over the hypothalamus. So we already know where the hypothalamus is, right? Mm -hmm. This thing right here, fourth ventricle, third ventricle, and then you have a hypothalamus. So this big, big hole, fourth ventricle. This little hole, third ventricle, and right underneath it is your thalamus. So you got to kind of use your imagination, but anything south of that, that is your hypothalamus. Now, we already know, uh, or don't we? Oh, yeah, this is MED210. We already know that the hypothalamus was the uh, big thing regarding hormones, right? Hunger, mood, and it's right here, right next to what? Breathing and eating. So you could see the things that are more in depth, like your ventricles and all these other things, they're crazy important. And they and whoever built us put them deep, deep in our in our brain, right? So the judgment part and all that it's important, but not as important as breathing and all that other stuff. So with that being said, we looked at the outside, we looked at the inside, we also looked at uh, the the major functions of the major parts. If nothing else, um, uh, look at relook at the uh, the chapter. So you guys. You guys are good with this. You want to look at this a couple more minutes. Now, uh, for all the viewers at home as well, 
I will put I will put a uh, video and I see uh, how many of you, Ms. Newman, Ms. Kamara, Ms. Kier, I see you, all three of you. So all of you guys get credit. Next week's exam will be uh, on Moodle. And I will put in um, a previous lecture uh, uh, tonight, um, a video of, of um, uh, what do you call that? Of um, reproductive and focus. Um, even though my video has male reproductive, focus only on the female. I don't think I don't, I think I have one or two questions or maybe no questions regarding male, um, male reproductive system, but big, big time questions on the menstrual cycle. So watch that video. I will post it later on after laboratory. And if nobody has any questions, uh, week nine, next week is lab. I mean, not lab, next week is final exam, December 15th, 6 p.m. So look at 5.55 p.m. And I'll see you guys there. Have a good night, Professor. Good night, everyone. Will do. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.